Um, what I want to do here is just run through some basics on uh, just the bare minimum principles that pretty much apply to any fish. Uh, and there's kind of 10 different steps to make you a better angler. So we'll get into it right now. And I just got back from Florida last night at 1 a.m. So I built this presentation on the airplane. I flew in, got home at 1 a.m. last night, went to work at 4.30 this morning, and here I am. So <laughs> uh, speaking of Florida, it's a family vacation but I like to fish a lot, so we do some fishing down there. So I'll just show you a few pictures of some fish we caught last week. This is a snook. We were mostly saltwater fishing uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, this is my father-in-law's snook. He, that was his biggest one that he's ever caught. That was about a 36 inch fish, really nice. We catch them right in the surf behind our condo there in the ocean. So they like to swim right on the edge of the sand. They, if the guys that cast way out there are casting right past all the big fish. Um, this, is, this is my sister-in-law. She got a nice one. And then we went on a trip offshore with my cousin, and we got a pretty nice haul out there. Those are barracuda teeth, and uh, they kind of put a northern pike to shame. <laughs> I've seen those come up and see these grouper right here. I've seen them cut those right in half and come back and eat the second half later. Like, they're just basically a swimming pair of uh, meat shears is what they are. So, wicked. Everything's mean in the ocean. Uh, there's a nice grouper and a couple different species of snapper we caught while we were down there. So, uh, that's, oh yeah, I also caught a 175 pound bull shark. So, you also don't want to mess with the front end of those either. <clears throat> that was my biggest fish to date. So, it was a really good trip. We had a lot of fun. All right, so let's get into 10 ways to become a better angler. Understand that the weather is key. So weather is what makes fish do things. There's basically three, three different factors that make fish do things. One is temperature, one is food, one is um, protection, and then certain times of year, it's the spawn. Those are basically all fish care about. They aren't real deep thinkers. They're not particularly philosophical or anything. So that's what they, that's their basic thought process. And they, they, the weather determines water temperature and it also determines how they're gonna feed, where the food moves to. So it's very important because it covers at least two of those factors that fish are interested in. Now this is a steelhead and the weather is important to steelhead because when it rains a lot, the rivers come up and that means something completely different than if we don't get rain and the rivers drop, as Ted well knows. And you can catch fish in both, in both. You can catch fish in high water and you can catch them in low water, but you have to fish them differently. You have to, the drift is different, your bait moves much faster, you have to use more weight when the river is high, and then when it drops down, the fish can see your bait a lot better, so you have to use lighter line to make sure that they don't spook from that line and then you have to use lighter weight to make sure that that bait drifts in the current correctly. That's just one example, but high and low pressure affect fish, um, you know, storm fronts coming through affect fish, and the best way to learn how to, how to read that is to fish in different weather conditions and take notes. Write down, you know, in a journal or something what the fish were doing that day. And there's a lot of videos you can watch to learn, you know, what fish do in certain weather conditions as well, but I like Amos's uh, method. He just keeps the bluegill in his aquarium and when it sits on the bottom, he knows the weather's no good. And when it comes up and, and starts swimming around, he knows that the fish are moving, so. <laughs> oh yeah, this, this is my dad with a couple big crappies and that, that particular time was a weather-related bite. It was just a really perfect day for fishing. It was calm, so we didn't have to deal with the wind and it had been steady weather for about three or four days. So uh, crappies in particular tend to not like weather changes. I've always done better on crappies in stable weather conditions and that was perfect and they were, they were on fire that night. Amos probably remembers when that was. <laughs> My dad probably does too. Those are some tanks. Number nine, study your target fish and learn its habits and preferences as well as possible. So <clears throat> this, is, this comes down to basically studying the fish itself. 
and learning those four things that I talked about. Learning when those happen, when the spawn happens, what that fish's preferred temperature range is, uh, learning where that, that animal, that fish likes to hide, what cover it likes to use, does it like weeds, does it like wood cover, um, and you know, just learning as much as you can about the fish and the species itself. And you know, species change with latitude in the country as well as in different types of water conditions. So there's a lot to learn about even just one species of fish. There is so much to learn. I'm never gonna end my learning process with fish because there's always new things that you can, you can learn by studying them. And I, I just, I constantly feed my brain with more information, more information. I'm always watching videos, reading books, studying uh, fish biology, you name it, to learn more about these fish. Amos has been a good resource because he works directly with fish in the fisheries department and I've been able to learn a lot from him as well. So um, that's a very important thing. If you want to learn how to catch a specific fish, learn what it does, learn where it wants to be, learn the water temperature, learn all that stuff about that fish and then target that fish. If you're just going out there to catch whatever fish you want, you know, might, whatever might, fish might want to bite your line, you're not gonna catch as many fish because like Amos said, if you have, go out with a purpose to catch a specific fish, you're gonna do the things that that fish, you're gonna look for places that fish wants to be and you're gonna use the baits that that fish wants to eat at that particular time and you're gonna do much better um, unless you don't do very well. And then I usually switch to another fish. <laughs> Sometimes they can really be frustrating, but it's really rewarding when you target a specific fish at a specific time and it all works out and you know that, okay, I nailed it this time. <clears throat> I got these fish figured out. It's a good feeling. Number eight, organize your tackle and keep your equipment maintained. Sounds pretty quiet out there. <laughs> this, is, this one is one that I've gotten better at over the years. I did not always do this very well, but the, more, the less time I had as, as I had a family and a, a son, uh, my son's name is Jackson, he's eight, I had less time to fish. So I learned that if I wanted my time on the water to be as efficient as possible, I had better get my gear in order and make sure that it's gonna be ready to go. So I, I organize my tackle, I label everything. This is a pile of tackle that does not belong anywhere in my garage. Everything's organized as much as possible. Um, I'm always retying leaders, making sure my line's good. Uh, everything is done ahead of time. So like when I go out and fish a bass tournament, for instance, I've already thought about every situation I might run into in that tournament. I've tied on the lures with the right line, the right leaders, and everything on eight or nine different rods for every condition I might run into before I even get in the boat. Because what happens if I don't do that? I go out there and I'm sitting in the boat tying on lures for half the tournament while other guys are casting, catching fish. And the same goes for recreational angling. The more you put into your tackle ahead of time, the more time you're gonna have to actually fish. Number seven, accept that the fish just aren't biting today is not an excuse. They are biting somewhere. I guarantee you, you can find fish that are biting any day out of the year. It's just a matter of figuring it out. You can get fish to bite something every single day of the year. Um, but it is a mental game because you can fish, I've fished all day for 10 hours and caught zero fish. And then all of a sudden, you figure something out and it's boom, 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 fish. Uh, we had a tournament like that one time. We were fishing bass and we were fishing a lake that had a lot of lay down trees and they kind of extended over deep water. And it was about 15 feet deep under those trees. And we were pitching jigs, you know, to try and catch bass that might be underneath those trees. And we knew they had to be there. There was perfect cover. We knew they had to be there but they wouldn't bite. <clears throat> well, we assumed they weren't biting. We even saw a couple and we just couldn't get them to bite. Well, <laughs> then we just said, okay, they gotta bite something. We're gonna keep changing our lures until we get something to hit. So I threw a weightless Senko. Some of you might know what a Senko is. It's a, basically a plastic stick 
just a plastic soft bait, wacky rigged, and we pitched them towards those trees and we were just gonna let them slow fall to the bottom unweighted. And within a foot of sinking, the first one I chucked out there got eaten by a three and a half pound largemouth. And we ended up winning the tournament in 20 minutes because the fish were hanging right near the surface at the top of those trees, they weren't on the bottom. So when we were pitching jigs, they were going straight to the bottom past the fish and we were missing them. But as soon as we had a slow falling lure, they had time to catch it before it got below them. And we ended up catching, I think, 12 and a half pounds of largemouth in 20 minutes and shooting back to the launch <laughs> and winning. We had nothing before that. We had zero fish to weigh in. So that's what I mean. They're, they're biting somewhere. You just have to figure it out. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> Number six, know the rules and study the regulations. This is important. We want to make sure that we don't have a bad day because the warden shows up. We don't want to see the warden and go, oh no, <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing everything right right now. You do your best to know the regulations and study them, know the limits of what you can catch, you know, know what you need to release, how to release it properly, um, know what species you can target at certain times of year. You should probably put life jackets and throwables in your boat, right Amos? Make sure those are in there. I've heard that that's important. Um, so those are all important things because when, when you disobey the law, it's not a good witness for one thing. It does not make Christians look good when we're, we're the ones getting tickets because we are supposed to follow the rules. And number two, it's not good for the, the fish. You know, if we're not obeying the rules that are set up to protect the population, if we're over bagging, etc. And it's just not a fun day when the warden shows up and gives you a ticket. It, it really sours it, I've, I've found. <laughs> Learn to take better photos. So this one I'm going to spend a little time on with you guys because this is something I've gotten good at. I've gotten good at taking uh, pictures of fish and I've found ways to make them more interesting than just a guy holding a fish. So also uh, real quick, this is a good hold. This is my buddy Kyle Sorensen. We were fishing on the Brule last fall and he caught this really nice steelhead but he's got two contact points and he's holding up the fish horizontally. That's that's how you want to hold a fish for a photo. You don't want to grab them by the gills and lift them up because that can damage the gills. And uh, you also don't want to lift a bass horizontally by its mouth. You want to support it underneath the belly. But uh, I'm going to go over a few tips for you guys on how to take some better pictures. Uh, that one was actually on the ice. That was a walleye I caught. Sometimes it's just stopping for a second to notice the beauty that's right in front of you. So this was a redfish I caught down in Florida and it was just the tail and I noticed the scale pattern and I just got real close and took a nice shot of the tail there. And um, sometimes it's just slowing down and just looking at a fish and kind of looking for the patterns and admiring it. Because when God made fish, he was painting. I mean, they're just beautiful. <clears throat> Release shots are always positive, like this big bluegill. I decided not to flay it, it was a really big one. So I took a picture as I was letting it go into the water. And that just gives kind of a sense of, uh, you know, the fish getting to swim away unharmed. Net shots can be cool, you know, taking a shot down into the net. A uh, photo with the setup you caught the fish on, like that smallmouth, I caught it on a fly rod, just lay the rod next to it and take a shot. That can be really, neat picture. Think outside the box. This was just a frozen walleye that I had laying on the bare ice and it just looked cool. So I took a shot of it and it turned out really neat I think. Uh, get up close and personal. So I like to get up and take really close shots of fish. Just parts of fish. Just They just look so uh, interesting and unique rather than a fish held way back away from the camera. And just because it's not a walleye or a bass doesn't mean it won't make a cool photo, right? That's a sturgeon. Most people don't even know what a sturgeon is, but I think it looks pretty cool with those big spikes coming off its back. And, you know, there's a lot of different fish that have some cool patterns on them. And I know Frank's just mouth is just watering right now. He's like the sturgeon master. <laughs> 
shoot down the length of the fish instead of just holding it broadside, hold it out in front of you, kind of like the, in this photo, you can get a different perspective on the fish. It adds some depth to it. Uh, quick picture with the bait still in the fish's mouth. That's kind of a cool shot to, just so you can remember what you caught that fish on. I got that swim bait hanging out there. Every now and then a good old just hold the fish out and smile is good too. I'm not saying that's bad, but this is just a kind of a, a few more ideas for you. All right, and then number four, don't be afraid to think outside the box when you're fishing. Um, this particular day when uh, I think I think my dad was with me actually, or he came out later, but I was fishing smallmouth. It was the middle of summer. They were supposed to be deep. Uh, the water was really warm. I, I kept fishing deep for them. I was expecting them to be out offshore on deep structure. But I, I decided to move up shallow because I wasn't catching much. And I was just throwing big swim baits for pike. And all of a sudden I get smoked and I knew it wasn't a pike right away. It was fighting like a bass. And I was not targeting bass. I had switched what I was targeting, but those, these big smallmouth had moved up on like, in like five feet of water on a weed bed, there was a big school of perch in there. And they were just chasing down these perch and they wanted big baits. They wouldn't eat anything small. I tried some finesse stuff after I caught that one. They wouldn't touch it. Um, but a big six inch swim bait about this long it was what they wanted to eat. So I ended, we ended up catching three or four more big smallmouth and I actually had the biggest smallmouth I think I've ever had on jumped in through the hook in that same spot. So that was basically an accident. But you know, if you allow yourself to just see what's going on and adapt to it and think outside the box, um, that's what makes you a better angler. That's the difference a lot of times between you and the guy who just gets stuck doing the same thing all day because it worked last year, right? <clears throat> and then this one, um, this is actually a bait that I've been, it's designed for bass and crappies. It's uh, made by Euro Tackle. It's called the Z-Viber. But I started using it for trout just to see if it would work and it turns out that it's a very good trout bait and there's not a lot of guys throwing vibrating crankbaits for trout but I ended up trying it and it worked. I thought outside the box. It, you probably won't find many articles on, on throwing vibrating cranks for trout but they work. They really work. Anyone know who that guy is? That's Al Linder. Uh, I, got to, I had the distinct privilege of fishing with Al uh, a few weeks ago. He actually was in my boat with me. Uh, he was doing some scouting for an upcoming episode of Linder's Angling Edge. And uh, number three is basically what Al and I did to find bass, is we paid attention to our surroundings and we made adjustments according to what we saw. Um, we, wa we were watching water temperatures constantly. We found some warmer water. We noticed that there was fish there and we changed our tactics. We were targeting smallmouth, but we decided to switch to largemouth because we had noticed that they were moved into this bay. And it's just all those little things that you start to notice once you slow down, focus, concentrate on what's going on. And Al is a master of that. I mean, he is basically the greatest of all time uh, when it comes to learning what fish do in certain conditions and paying attention and learning things about those fish. Uh, he actually told me a little story. They, they were filming a show on crappies using jigging rapalas in open water and they accidentally had left one behind the boat and they started to pull it back and a walleye hit it out the back in like 40 feet of water. So they thought, well, was that an accident or maybe not? So they, they cast it back again and popped another walleye. And they ended up catching 30 walleyes on that jigging wrap in the basin behind them accidentally. And now there's almost every tournament that's won, uh, probably half the tournaments, the walleye tournaments that are won, are won on jigging wraps doing exactly what they learned that day. So he brought that out and now everybody's doing it. Everybody. And it was an accident. They, were, they didn't even mean to do it, but they paid attention and they noticed, wait a minute, that's probably not a coincidence. Something might, there might be something to this. And now it's probably in the top three walleye techniques for winning tournaments in the country easily. So 
Number two, be sure to care for your catch properly and respect creation. So God made these fish for us to eat, right? Many of us are fish eaters. I'm a fish eater. I love to eat them, but I don't need every fish I catch. I just don't. So I release a lot of fish. And when I release them, I really take care of them. I want them to survive. So I leave them out of the water as little as possible. Try and unhook them in the water if you can. Just lift them out for a quick picture, get them back in the water. Um, you know, the, the less time they're out of the water, the better chance of survival they have. Uh, and also, <clears throat> if you are fishing in really warm water, that can be a problem for fish. They don't release well in warm water. So if you're targeting big fish in warm water, you have to be extremely careful with them. Uh, and I've even stopped fishing for them just because I knew they weren't going to survive if I kept catching them. So there was a, a time I found some big pike on some deep cribs in the middle of summer and I caught two pigs, like over 10 pounds, but they weren't releasing well. The surface temp was like 80 degrees and I knew I could catch more, but I just decided I was going to leave them alone because those are rare fish and you just don't want to kill them for no reason. So. Um, I just left them alone, caught two that was good enough, and uh, leave them for somebody else to catch, and hopefully they'll survive uh, another year. And also, take care of your fillets, take care of your fish, get them cooled down right away after you kill them, you know, keep them in a live well, bleed them out. I always bleed out all my fish, they're going to taste better. You just cut the gills, let them bleed out in the water, when you fillet them, clean white fillets, you got no blood in them at all, they'll turn out just like that. Uh, that's a coho, a lake trout, and a burbot up there from Lake Superior, and no blood at all. That's, I literally just took those off the fish, they're not washed or anything. But I bled them out by slicing the gills, you just don't have that mess, and the, the fillets will taste better. So, And number one, this is my son Jackson, keep your priorities in order. So God first, family, others in the church, and fishing, right? That's the most important thing I can tell you. That's number one, is to keep God at the center and your family inside of that or outside of that, and then others, and then your fishing. You don't need anything else. Those, that's all you need, right? <laughs> well, you might want to add hunting in there somewhere. But uh, make sure that your priorities are straight. And it's hard to do. It's hard to do. I've been married for 13 years. It's hard to be married. It's work. Uh, I would like to go fishing a lot more than I do. I am blessed to have a wife that is okay with me fishing as much as I do, but I could still be discontent, right? I could still screw up my priorities, and I do at times. I push it sometimes, and I shouldn't, because what matters in eternity is, your, is God what you do for him, what you do for other people, and what you do for your family, that's number one. So um, that's pretty much it. I know that was kind of a little bit long, Nathaniel, but like, I didn't practice this at all, so I didn't know how long it was going to go. I was sitting in an airplane hoping it was about right. <laughs> so uh, I can take a few questions. I'll, how much time do I have for questions, Nathaniel? Take some questions. Anyone have any questions about anything I talked about? Yes. You were talking about letting them bleed out. Mm -hmm. I was always under the impression it was best to keep them alive as long as you could until you got on shore. Sure. Right? Yep. Okay. It depends on what you want to do. You can, you can keep them alive in a live well as long as you want, and they'll be fine. Uh, and then what I do typically is I'll just slice the gills as I'm loading my boat up in the live well and let the water drain out with the blood and then they're, they're dead when you leave the lake, which is the law, too. Um, otherwise, the other thing you can do is you can bring a cooler with ice. You can slit the gills in the live well while you're fishing, put them on ice right away, and then chill them down. But you don't want to kill them in the live well and just leave them sit in warm water. Correct. That is, that is a good point. You don't want to do that. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, anybody else? Thomas? Yes. Mm -hmm. A couple weeks ago, my, uh, my son and my, my dad has got Alzheimer's, but he's still, he can still catch a fish. Um, mm -hmm. they, they fish below uh, the Shatek Dam and up above the Shatek Dam. Now, in Shatek, there's a cell that you really can afford to do anymore. But 
Mm -hmm. He says, you could see the crappies' death. He says, you could almost walk on the crappies, and they threw everything they could at them. Mm -hmm. Plastics, waxies, feathers, feather jigs, and everything, and couldn't buy a crappie. Mm -hmm. And some guy comes along with a pail of minnows, and he sits down there, and one crappie right after another with those minnows. So mm -hmm. this is one thing they didn't try. Yeah, that's very true. He, uh, basically, he's saying... You know they were using artificials for crappies and they could see the crappies they could actually visually see them but they couldn't catch them and that happens i've been there sometimes when you can see the fish they can see you too and they can see your line they can see your hook they can see everything that you can see so they're much more wary in those conditions and if you put a live bait down there that looks super real in that clear water with light line small hook so that minnow swims super realistically you're probably going to have more luck than you are with a big chartreuse jig, right? In dirty water, it might be completely different. You know, a fast ripped jig might catch more fish in bright colors in, in dirty water because they can see it better. You know, on Lake Superior, it's crystal clear water, and we fish for 10 plus pound brown trout with four pound test and number eight hooks because they see anything bigger than that. You got to fight them a lot longer. You know, and you lose a few fish, not too many, but a few big fish because they just won't bite if you have heavy line. So. To finish that story, mm -hmm. my dad, who's 88 years old and his mind is going real faster, he mentioned to my son, he says, we should maybe get some minnows. <laughs> <laughs> my son kind of kicked himself in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, there's times live bait works much better than, than artificials, but there's times the artificials are much more efficient because you don't have to rebait a hook. If the fish are on fire, I much prefer to use artificials because you can keep the pace up and catch more fish without rebaiting. But there's times where you just can't beat live bait for sure. Any other questions? Are most of those pros like a one species expert? Um, most of them are. You know, the guys fishing tournaments, yes. Like all the bass tournament guys, the walleye tournament guys, salmon tournament guys, they're pretty species specific. Um, you get into like the Lindners, like Al, he is a multi-species expert. I mean, he his forte is catching fish anywhere, any species, you name it, he's gonna find it and catch it. Now, his favorite species is smallmouth and he loves walleyes, but He'll catch carp, he'll catch, you name it, anything. He was just out catching carp right before he came out and fished with me. Uh, he's 77 and he's walking down a river bank catching 20 pound carp <laughs> right before he came and fished with me. So uh, it depends on who you're talking about. But most of the tournament anglers are specific species guys and they are the best of the best at that particular species. Any other questions? Yeah, Frank. We were talking about uh, by accident with the jigging raft. Yep. Can you talk a little bit more about what they were doing? And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, line? sure. So the technique with a jigging rappel in open water, most of you guys have probably seen them more for ice fishing than open water fishing. It's a kind of a minnow shaped bait with a plastic tail on it. And when you jig it, it swims out and, and comes back. It's a real heavy bait. Well, what they figured out is you could make a long, well, a decent cast, let it sink to the bottom, and you can just rip it, pop it really aggressively. And that, dark, that bait will just shoot off the bottom and drop straight back down. And the walleyes react to it in a way that they don't react to live bait. They're not trying to eat it, it's like a reaction. So when that thing slams into the bottom right in front of them, yeah, just like that. That's a different brand, but same type of thing. When that thing slams into the bottom in front of them, they just pounce on it and they pin it to the bottom. They go straight down like this and they actually pin it to the bottom of the lake. And that thing's got sticky sharp hooks all over it. And as soon as you lift, go on that next rip, that fish is on there. You usually don't feel the bite. You, they're just there when you lift. And that's how they catch all kinds of big walleyes doing that in tournaments. But it's a deep water tactic. It doesn't work very well in shallow water or on rocks because you're just gonna get hung up. But like. Deep mud flats, it's in the middle of summer, very good technique. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right, I think I'm out of time anyway. Time to talk turkey with the master Nathaniel. <laughs> Thanks, guys.
Thanks, Caleb. You bet. Good job. Thank you.